Hello and welcome to the 2016 edition of Meet the Protocols. I'm paramedic Joe Savak. And I'm EMT Cynthia G. The past year has brought a few challenges to Maryland EMS providers. From understanding how to manage emerging infectious diseases and increased call volumes, to assisting with large-scale events, such as the papal visit. Now here to begin this year's Meet the Protocols is the Executive Director of MEMS, Dr. Kevin Seaman. Dr. Seaman, thank you for joining us. Hello, I'm Dr. Kevin Seaman, Executive Director of MEMS, and I'd like to welcome you to the 2016 Protocol Update. First, I'd like to remind you that my priorities are to do what's best for our patients and what is best for you, our EMS providers. MIMS is grateful that you are taking the time, as you annually do, to update your knowledge, which translates to improving the care you deliver in the field. By making these protocols part of your everyday practice, you will continue to advance the highest level of pre-hospital care and help carry on Maryland's reputation as a world-renowned EMS system. Many providers have had questions about accepting an electronic MOLST form. Sarah Setti, our Assistant Attorney General for MIMS, wanted to pass on the following. Electronic MOLST forms are valid, recognizing that not all ambulances and EMS providers are equipped to receive, store, or transmit electronic copies, and they are not required to do so. Now, I would like to highlight a few of the major protocol changes that have been made this year to assist you as you provide care in the field. There's been a change to pediatric age definition. In an effort to streamline the management of pediatric patients, the Pediatric Emergency Medical Advisory Committee has consolidated the varied age criteria into eight clearly defined medication, procedure, and destination categories, which have been applied throughout the entire protocol. Return of Spontaneous Circulation, or ROSC, MIMS has adopted a formalized ROSC protocol for all patients for both BLS and ALS providers. High performance CPR, this has been moved from an optional supplemental protocol to a standard procedure for all providers. Quality compressions with minimal interruptions are a key component to a positive outcome for our patients in cardiac arrest. In the meantime, thank you for all you're doing to care for our patients. You are the backbone of our system. I look forward to working with you as we move forward and thanks again for your commitment to the citizens you serve and this update to the 2016 protocols. Diabetic emergencies are common and the management of this disease by EMS providers will change in 2016. From Region 5, here to tell us more about the changes to the glucometer protocol and dosing for dextrose is Chief Sean Davidson from the Lexington Park Volunteer Rescue Squad. Historically, ALS providers have relied on 50% dextrose to reverse hypoglycemia. Evidence has shown that there is a better alternative in terms of dextrose concentration that ensures the patient gets a more finely tuned dose and receives that dose in a concentration that has fewer side effects. Administering 10% dextrose can be titrated the lower concentration is less sclerosing to vessels and will not cause tissue necrosis or damage if it extravasates. While 50% dextrose is still approved for patient care, ALS providers and agencies are encouraged to begin transitioning to 10% dextrose. This section will review key changes to the assessment and treatment of hypoglycemic patients. The hypertonicity of 50% dextrose can be problematic for a number of reasons such as extravasation injury and direct hyperosmolar sclerosing effects to the vasculature. Additionally, pre-hospital providers in Maryland have historically given one bolus of the entire 25 grams in a preloaded syringe. This all or none dosing regimen often results in overshooting the therapeutic goal of normalizing the patient's blood glucose and having them return to a normal mental status. Medical evidence has shown the 10% dextrose administered in a more controlled fashion is just as effective as demonstrated by identical return to a GCS of 15 while not having the risks associated with the use of 50% dextrose. Changing the concentration of dextrose in the formulary and the dosing regimen 
is an evidence-based change that will benefit a large number of patients. The glucometer should be utilized to determine the blood glucose level in an attempt to determine the cause of a patient's condition and provide treatment for such. The indications for its use include for both ALS and BLS providers, seizures, altered mental status or unresponsiveness, pediatric bradycardia, pediatric cardiac arrest, stroke, physical and chemical restraints, cyanide poisoning, altered mental status in wilderness EMS. These wilderness EMS patients are usually treated without the use of a glucometer. 10% dextrose generally will be packaged in 250 milliliter bags. This means that for every 10 milliliters of fluid, there is one gram of dextrose present. If you were to administer the whole bag, you would have administered a total of 25 grams, which is the same as the 50 milliliters of 50% dextrose. When administering 10% dextrose to an adult, providers should give boluses of 5 grams in 50 milliliters one minute apart to a maximum of 25 grams in 250 milliliters. This dose should be titrated to the following effects. The patient has a return to normal mental status and the patient's blood glucose is at least 90 milligrams per deciliter. These indicators are the same if you administer the traditional 50% dextrose concentration. Should the patient persist with altered mental status and a glucose level less than 90 milligrams per deciliter, the dosing regimen should be repeated. If an IV cannot be administered and the patient's blood glucose level is less than 70 milligrams per deciliter, providers should administer one milligram of glucagon intramuscularly. In the neonatal population, hypoglycemia treatment will begin if the blood glucose is less than 30 milligrams per deciliter. Patients who are less than 28 days will receive two milliliters per kilogram of 10% dextrose IV or IO. This formulation can be made by removing 40 milliliters of fluid from a 50% dextrose package and replacing it with 40 milliliters of lactated ringers. If the patient's glucose remains less than 40 milligrams per deciliter after the first dose, medical consultation must be made for orders for a second dose. Patients greater than 28 days who have not yet reached their 18th birthday should begin hypoglycemia treatment if the blood glucose level is less than 70 milligrams per deciliter. If necessary, these patients will receive two to four milliliters per kilogram of 25% dextrose IV or IO. 25% dextrose can be made by removing 25 milliliters of fluid from a 50% dextrose container, replacing the contents with 25 milliliters of lactated ringers. If the glucose level remains below 70 milligrams per deciliter, a medical consultation must be made for orders for a second dose. After an evaluation by the Protocol Review Committee, several changes were made to medical consult requirements and dosing for some of the more commonly used medications by EMS providers in Maryland in order to improve the efficiency of patient care. Joining us from Region 4 to explain the changes is Dr. Deborah Davis, Emergency Department Medical Director at the Shore Health Medical Center at Chestertown and Jurisdictional Medical Director for Kent County. In an effort to allow EMS providers to use their clinical judgment and remain focused on patient care, MIMS has reduced the number of medical consult requirements for medication administration. This section is designed to update all EMS providers on these changes. Naloxone. Historically, the administration of naloxone has been an ALS skill. It's been limited to a maximum dose of 2 milligrams before medical consultation for patients older than 28 days. For patients younger than 28 days, the administration of naloxone is contraindicated. EMRs under the optional supplemental protocol and EMTs under the Maryland Medical Protocols for EMS providers are permitted to administer naloxone. The use of heroin and synthetic and prescription opioids, which may vary in potency, is an epidemic. 
in 2014, the legislature approved the administration of intramuscular or intranasal naloxone by laypersons and non-medical personnel, such as law enforcement, if they were trained and certified. This was done in an effort to reduce death and disability associated with heroin and opioid overdoses. This year, due to the spreading epidemic of heroin, synthetic and prescription opioids, which may vary in potency, and to eliminate confusion for providers about who can and when to administer naloxone, the requirements for medical consultation have been removed. The revised protocols allow for titration or repeat dosing above two milligrams. Should a patient not respond to an initial dose of naloxone, additional doses may be administered. However, providers should not ignore other possible causes for respiratory depression and decreased level of consciousness. Midazolam and adenosine. Two changes have been made for CRTIs for the administration of midazolam and adenosine. For the CRTI who witnesses an actively seizing patient, midazolam may now be administered without consult. The medical consultation requirement has also been removed for patients who are being treated with adenosine for a stable, regular tachycardia. Both of these changes apply to the adult and pediatric patient. Odansetron. The relief of nausea or vomiting is beneficial to the patient and can help the provider complete the patient assessment. In an effort to increase comfort for the patient, the indications for administration of odansetron the routes of administration and medical consultation requirements have all been revised. Previously, the patient would need to present with nausea and vomiting to receive a dancitron. Now a patient may present with either of these indications in order to receive the medication. A new route of administration, an orally disintegrating tablet, or ODT, has been approved. In most cases, this ODT route of administration should be reserved for patients complaining of nausea who are not actively vomiting. The following dosing may be repeated once without medical consultation. Medical consultation is still required for a third dose for both adults and pediatrics. The initial dosing in adults has been increased to eight milligrams slow IV over two to five minutes or four to eight milligrams intramuscular, or eight milligrams ODT. The maximum total dose permitted for adults is 24 milligrams. Patients who are 13 years or older receive eight milligrams ODT, or eight milligrams slow IV, over two to five minutes. Pediatric patients less than 13 years old receive 0.1 milligrams per kilogram slow IV over two to five minutes. If an IV is not established, the dose is 0.1 milligrams per kilogram intramuscular for a maximum single dose of eight milligrams. The maximum total dose permitted is 0.3 milligrams per kilogram or 24 milligrams, whichever is lower. Whether it's in the course of carrying out your duty as an EMS provider or attending a family gathering, many of us have had an experience with someone suffering from an allergic reaction. Anaphylaxis has been broken out into its own protocol to highlight its importance. To discuss these changes with us is Lieutenant John Scruggs, an EMS duty officer from Prince George's County Fire and EMS Department in Region 5. EMS providers are called to the scene of many emergencies during the course of their careers. None of those calls may be more time sensitive than a call for a patient suffering from anaphylaxis. This year, the Protocol Review Committee reviewed the allergic reaction protocol. The committee proposed to separate allergic reaction and anaphylaxis 
into two separate protocols. It is essential that EMS providers are able to rapidly differentiate between a mild reaction, one that makes a patient uncomfortable, itchy, versus the life-threatening reaction associated with anaphylaxis. Anaphylaxis is defined in the Maryland Medical Protocols as the acute onset of illness after exposure to a known allergen with hypotension or the acute onset of illness after exposure to a known or unknown allergen with two or more of the following, eutycaria of the skin and or mucosa or acute swelling or edema of the tongue, airway, lips, respiratory compromise, hypotension, persistent GI symptoms of vomiting, abdominal pain, or diarrhea. The immediate treatment for this condition for both BLS and ALS providers is the administration of epinephrine. The epinephrine can be the patient's own prescribed auto-injector or one brought to the scene by the EMS provider. The protocol indicates what actions providers should perform initially and then what actions should be performed after the administration of epinephrine. Epinephrine is a life-saving drug for patients suffering from anaphylaxis. Anaphylactic reactions impact multiple organ systems and cause bronchial constriction and increase capillary leakage. The administration of albuterol is important along with the antihistamine effects associated with diphenhydramine. Aggressive fluid resuscitation should be administered to correct hypotension. An epinephrine drip may be considered by ALS providers if these conditions are met. The anaphylactic patient is an adult greater than 18 years of age only. The patient is refractory to the three doses of intramuscular epinephrine. And the patient is still in extremis with severe hypotension or has impending respiratory failure. This drip may be administered without consult. The epinephrine drip for adults replaces the one milligram of epinephrine, one to 10,000 IV with medical consultation. Administering epinephrine via drip versus manual slow IV push has shown to have patient safety benefits. These include a reduction of unwanted cardiac side effects, such as uncontrolled tachycardia, and possible exacerbation of previous cardiac conditions. Make sure the patient is on a cardiac monitor before administering the epinephrine drip. In order to make the drip, providers will mix one milligram of epinephrine, either one to 1,000 or one to 10,000, in a one liter bag of lactated ringers. The drip must be administered via an intravenous or interosseous infusion. Initiate the infusion with a wide open macro drip, titrating to a systolic pressure greater than 90 millimeters of mercury. The epinephrine drip procedure must be documented on the PCR and an exceptional call must be noted. The provider must also immediately notify the EMS jurisdiction medical director of this procedure. Treating a patient in anaphylaxis is a situation in which a provider can truly make a difference and save a life. Early recognition and understanding the patient's presentation is paramount to a positive outcome. This past year, providers were faced with assessing patients with an emerging infectious disease, such as Ebola, increased awareness of proper personal protective equipment, and transport destination decisions, 
a new protocol has been added for 2016 in order to provide clarity for providers and make the management of these patients a smooth process, from identification to transfer of care at the appropriate hospital. Timothy Collins from Lower Somerset County Ambulance and Rescue Squad in Region 4 will review the Emerging Infectious Disease Protocol with us. I would like to start with the background for Emerging Infectious Disease Protocol. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the Maryland Department of Health and Mental Hygiene are moving to three levels of hospital recognition for management of persons under investigation, or PUIs, for an Emerging Infectious Disease. Every emergency department is first viewed as a frontline hospital, capable of placing a patient in aerosol and graphic isolation, but not able to run all the essential diagnostic tests for a PUI. Then there are treatment level hospitals that can admit the confirmed emerging infectious disease patient to an isolation unit and treat him or her. The new hospital level is called the assessment hospital. The assessment hospital is able to place a PUI in aerosol and grapple isolation for up to 96 hours. Staff at this hospital level perform essential diagnostic testing to determine if the patient has an emerging infectious disease that requires transfer and admission to the treatment hospital. So, how are you expected to know which patient has emerging infectious disease? An emerging infectious disease is an infectious disease for which incidence in humans has increased in the past two decades or threatens to increase in the near future. These diseases which respect no national boundaries include new infections resulting from changes or evolution of existing organisms, known infections spreading to new geographic areas or populations, previously unrecognized infections appearing in areas undergoing ecologic transformation, Old infections re-emerging as a result of antimicrobial resistance in known agents or breakdowns in public health measures. How do we identify a person under investigation? As emerging, emerging infection diseases become more prevalent, the CDC typically publish a description of each disease called a case definition. The case definition provides a listing of travel and exposure history plus signs and symptoms associated with PUI. EM providers should utilize the case definition to determine whether to include or exclude a PEI for specific testing or treatment and specific isolation or quarantine measures. These case definitions will be posted on the MIMS website and include specific guidance on the identification, treatment, and appropriate transport of these patients and the appropriate use of PPE. PUIs at a residence should be transported directly to an assessment hospital. If the travel time to assessment hospital is greater than 45 additional minutes further than the frontline hospital, the EMS provider should transport to the frontline hospital unless your EMS operation program allows you to go further. Pediatric patients under the age of 15 discovered at home or in a non-healthcare environment should be transported to a treatment hospital that is also a pediatric trauma center. Priority 1 and Priority 2 patients with unresolved symptoms that cannot be managed outside the hospital should be taken to the closest frontline hospital. They are exceptions to where patients should be transported, which are listed in the 2016 Maryland Medical Protocols for EMS providers. All providers should review these exceptions and be familiar with them when in doubt about where to transport. Obtaining medical direction from the closest frontline and assessment hospitals is always an option to determine the appropriate destination. Some of these PUI cases may be directly identified by the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene or a local health officer. In these cases, MIMS will be directly in touch with the EMS operational program and will provide the destination hospital for the EMS providers, potentially overriding the above protocol guidance. Prior to beginning the transport, EMS providers transporting PUIs for designated EIDs must contact the receiving hospital via EMRC. This should be done as early as possible to allow the hospital staff to prepare. The term PUI must be used in communications to ensure the hospital understands and is prepared to receive the patient. Upon arrival, 
providers must enter the hospital through the entrance designated by the receiving hospital. In conclusion, make sure you have access to the appropriate personal protection equipment for both aerosol and droplet infectious diseases. Be familiar with the front line assessment and treatment hospitals in or near your EMS operational program. Please be safe out there. Responding to a call for a drowning child can be a traumatic experience for any EMS provider. Use caution when assessing a breathing, awake child or adult who is no longer in the water and may not appear to need care from EMS. Delayed complications may lead to an unpleasant outcome. In this situation, adults and other family members may refuse service for themselves or their child. Remember, initial appearances in an immersion victim can be deceiving and an expert opinion may help change the mind of a patient or parent who is experiencing a frightening situation. From Region 3 is Russell Halterman, Assistant Chief Emergency Medical Services from Mount Airy Volunteer Fire Company, joins us to explain what providers should do in this situation and why it is important. More than 0.7% of all deaths worldwide are attributed to drowning. Submersion or immersion deaths and injuries are not just a childhood occurrence. Based on the 2012 New England Journal of Medicine article entitled Drowning and an AMA publication in 2015, it's clear that many water immersion victims appear well after being extracted from the water, yet they may have complications hours later. The decision to transport the unconscious or non-answering patient to the emergency department is obvious. The challenge is when a patient, adult or child, is awake and answering questions, and the patient or guardian is not sure if they should go to the hospital following this stressful event. It's up to you, the EMS provider, to perform an adequate assessment and encourage these victims to seek medical evaluation. MIMS would like you to be sure to listen to the patient's throat and lungs for strider or rails, both of which indicate the need for emergency department evaluation. MIMS has added an alert for the pediatric patient in the 2016 protocols. If the parent or guardian refuses medical care or transport, provider shall contact a pediatric base station physician. Just adding the pediatric base station physician's concerns will often convince the parent or guardian to have the child seen for a medical evaluation. The physician consult is not, I repeat, not to get the approval to leave the patient on the scene. This is to document that you did everything you and the system could do to protect the child. Specifically identifying the cause of an illness in a patient who appears to have overdosed on an unknown substance can be difficult, especially if the patient's behavior indicates to the provider that a physical and chemical restraint is necessary. However, these patients may be experiencing excited delirium syndrome, which is now covered by a new treatment protocol. Here to share the details of this new protocol is Dr. Matthew Levy, Jurisdictional Medical Director, Howard County Department of Fire and Rescue Services, and Associate Professor, Department of Emergency Medicine, the Johns Hopkins Hospital. With the proliferation of the availability of designer and novel drugs, combined with an increase in mass gathering events where such drugs are being used, and the heightened attention regarding the sudden death of individuals with bizarre and often aggressive behavior, we have introduced a dedicated protocol in 2016 for the identification and treatment of excited delirium syndrome. Excited delirium syndrome, or EXDS, is a syndrome, meaning it's a group of signs and symptoms that are associated with a sudden onset of bizarre and or aggressive behavior, including shouting, paranoia, panic, violence towards others, unexpected, or in some cases, superhuman physical strength, and hyperthermia. Hyperthermia often indicates a severe state of this condition and is a sign of imminent death in these cases. Left untreated, patients suffering from excited delirium syndrome are at an extremely high risk for death. 
We have already had deaths here in Maryland presumed to be from EXDS, particularly when the syndrome was not recognized and the person was physically restrained. Although there are many factors associated with sudden death in individuals who require restraint for excited delirium, these individuals develop a disturbance in thought, behavior, and mood and become agitated and violent. This abnormal neurologic and behavioral state leads to psychosis, multiple body system overload, and sudden death. Prompt pre-hospital identification and initiation of treatment for these patients is essential for a positive outcome. Again, the symptoms of excited delirium include bizarre and or aggressive behavior, shouting, paranoia, panic, violent towards other people, unexpected physical strength, and hyperthermia. EXDS was first associated with cocaine abuse and the stimulant toxicity protocol in the Maryland Medical Protocols addresses cocaine and some pathomimetic toxicity. However, EXDS has been observed in patients who have ingested other types of stimulants, including synthetic drugs, as well as those with many other causes. An important point to remember for pre-hospital personnel is that you will likely not be able to determine what, if any, substance the person has ingested. Pre-hospital providers should not spend valuable time attempting to determine what, if any, substance the individual ingested. Rather, efforts should be focused on scene safety, resuscitation, treatment, and stabilization. Likewise, making an immediate load-and-go decision and deferring treatment until the patient arrives at the hospital is not in the patient's best interests and may result in further harm to the patient or possibly even death. You also need to remember that these symptoms may be seen in patients with any number of other medical emergencies, including hypoxia, hypoglycemia, head injury, psychosis, sepsis, and withdrawal from drugs or alcohol. It is essential that pre-hospital EMS personnel remember this and maintain a high degree of situational awareness about these potential other causes and the need for pre-hospital treatment. Here are some other important points to remember. EXDS is a life-threatening emergency that may present itself as a law enforcement or behavioral problem, and the patient may have already been tasered or placed in police custody. EXDS is not necessarily easy to recognize given the often chaotic circumstances surrounding the call. There are potentially reversible medical emergencies, such as hypoglycemia and hypoxia, that must be addressed and managed as soon as possible. These patients need prompt treatment and early ALS care. Now that we've covered the background, let's go through the protocol in more detail. Starting with presentation. As already mentioned, EXDS, or excited delirium syndrome, is a potentially life-threatening condition in which a person is in a psychotic and extremely agitated state. Mentally, the individual is unable to process rational thought or to focus their attention. Physically, their body systems are functioning at such a high rate that they may begin to shut down and fail. And when these two factors occur at the same time, a person can act erratically enough that he or she becomes a danger to themselves or the general public. History of present illness in these patients often includes an ingestion of some type of stimulant or hallucinogenic drug. It may also include alcohol or drug withdrawal, and psychotic patients who are off of their medication. Signs and symptoms of EXDS are characterized as having a minimum of bizarre and aggressive behavior and one of the above history. The more signs and symptoms the patient exhibits, the more likely the patient is to have EXDS and the higher the risk for complications. Such symptoms include tachycardia, hypertension, high body temperature, dilated pupils, incoherent or nonsensical speech, rapid or inconsistent breathing patterns, paranoia, skin changes, including either hot or dry skin, as in an anticholinergic patient, or profuse sweating, such as in the cocaine, MDMA, or methamphetamine patient. Shivering may be seen, as would inappropriate removal of clothing. In patients who present after receiving multiple taser or other less lethal energy impact rounds from law enforcement, Many life-threatening medical emergencies present with similar signs and symptoms of excited delirium. It's very important to maintain the situational awareness. Examples include hypoglycemia, hypoxia, 
seizures or the period following a seizure, head injuries, sepsis, and many others. EMS personnel must always assess for the possibility of a medical emergency that is causing the patient's presentation. Another key symptom that occurs just prior to the onset of death in a patient experiencing excited delirium syndrome is what we call instant tranquility. This symptom is noted when a patient who has been very violent and agitated suddenly becomes quiet and lethargic. This is a harbinger of imminent death. This patient is going to have an imminent cardiopulmonary arrest. Patients who have undergone periods of prolonged physical struggle without sedation with benzodiazepines are at a very high risk for cardiac arrest. All efforts must be made by ALS providers to expeditiously administer midazolam to the agitated and struggling EXDS patient. As we move into treatment, let's first talk about some basic BLS but very important maneuvers. First and foremost, assuring the safety of your personnel and your providers. We have to make sure that scene is safe. As we initiate general patient care, as soon as possible, obtain a measured temperature in these patients as they often have severe hyperthermia. And if it's possible to identify the substance ingested, it's reasonable to do so. But again, efforts shouldn't be diverted away from taking care of the life-threatening emergency. Suspected EXDS patients with evidence of head trauma or other traumatic mechanisms of injuries should also receive the spinal protection protocol. Patients displaying signs of EXDS do not have the medical capacity to refuse care. If an EXDS patient resists the delivery of care, ALS resources, EMS supervisors where available, and law enforcement should be requested to facilitate the treatment and safe transport of that patient in an effective manner. Patients who exhibit violent behavior shall require a police officer to accompany the patient during physical transport. Applying physical restraint procedures should also be utilized per the restraint protocol. Patients displaying signs and symptoms of EXDS shall be treated and transported at the advanced life support level. ALS care and treatment will be guided by the signs and symptoms that the patient is exhibiting, as well as the possible occult injuries that may have occurred while the individual was being subdued. The appropriate life-saving treatment for EXDS is the administration of benzodiazepines, fluid resuscitation, and decreasing the hyperthermic core body temperature. An important alert, patients who have received multiple rounds of energy from conducted electric weapons, including taser, and are displaying signs of EXDS are at a heightened risk for sudden cardiac death. These patients should be treated with benzodiazepines and closely monitored for any evidence of hemodynamic collapse. Moving on to treatment of the adult ALS patient, establish IV slash IO access and consider blood draw if possible. Administer a 20 cc per kilogram IV fluid bolus of lactated ringers if the patient is tachycardic and or hyperthermic. Check the patient's glucose. Treat hypoglycemia accordingly. Administer midazolam in two milligram increments, slow IV slash IO push over one to two minutes. This may be repeated twice to a maximum total IV dose of six milligrams prior to consult. And reduce this by 50% in patients who are 69 years old or greater. If IV or IO is unavailable or unsafe due to circumstances surrounding the call, administer two milligram increments intranasally. And if IV, IO, or intranasal administration routes are not possible, it is then reasonable to give five milligram IM midazolam. Multiple doses may be required to achieve therapeutic effect and additional doses will require medical consultation. Consider the administration of cold packs to the groin, neck, and axilla for patients displaying evidence of hyperthermia. Patients displaying signs and symptoms of EXDS should not receive Haldol and or Benadryl for chemical restraint. These medications may worsen an anticholinergic crisis and Haldol increases the possibility of cardiac dysrhythmia by prolonging the QT interval and may also increase the chances of seizures by lowering the body's seizure threshold. Pediatric ALS care also includes establishing rapid vascular access and drawing blood if possible. Administer a 20 cc per kilogram IV fluid bolus of lactated ringer for the tachycardic or hyperthermic patient. Again, check a glucose in these patients and treat hypoglycemia accordingly. The midazolam dose for the pediatric patient is 
0.1 milligram per kilogram in two milligram increments, slow IV or IO push over one to two minutes with a maximal single dose of two milligrams. If IV or IO is unavailable or unsafe to obtain, administer two milligram increments of intranasal midazolam. And again, if IV, IO, or intranasal administration routes are unavailable or not possible, administer two milligrams IM. Multiple doses may be required to achieve that therapeutic effect, and the maximum total dose is five milligrams. Additional subsequent doses require consultation via an approved medical consultation center. Also for the pediatric patient, remember to consider the administration of cold packs to the groin, neck, and axilla for patients displaying evidence of hyperthermia. Continue with patient care and transport these patients expeditiously to the hospital. In summary, scene safety, comprehensive assessment including temperature and early recognition should be the EMS provider's focus. If the patient warrants physical and chemical restraint, please do so following the chemical restraint protocol with midazolam and Haldol. If you assess as the patient is having excited delirium from the start, go straight to midazolam as your drug of choice and withhold the Haldol as this may increase the risk of complications or seizures. If you did initially give the combined midazolam and Haldol dosing and later ascertain that the patient is an excited delirium syndrome, then proceed with midazolam only for repeat dosing. The evolution of care for stroke patients has come a long way in the past few years in Maryland. In July 2016, that evolution will continue with the addition of the Los Angeles Motor Scale, or LAMS, following the EMS provider identification of a positive Cincinnati Stroke Scale finding. Here to discuss the addition is EMT firefighter Courtney Bollinger from the Maryland Line Volunteer Fire Company in Region 3. For the 2016 Maryland Medical Protocols, there has been a change in the stroke protocol regarding stroke assessment. As you know, the current protocols highlight the Cincinnati Pre-Hospital Stroke Scale as a tool to assess if a patient may be having a stroke. The Cincinnati Scale is a highly sensitive stroke screening tool which will remain as the first assessment tool for identifying a patient with a possible stroke. Cincinnati Scale tests three areas for neurological deficit. Hands out in front with palms up and eyes closed for 10 seconds, looking for hands to drift or rotate, any facial droop, or speech difficulty repeating a simple sentence. Any one positive finding indicates the patient has sustained a stroke. The Cincinnati Stroke Scale does not provide a standard severity scale, so Maryland is adopting the Los Angeles Motor Scale, or LAMS. The LAMS Stroke Scale is a validated scale that was designed for both EMS and emergency department use to identify large vessel occlusion. Using the LAM scale, a score of four or greater demonstrated a sensitivity of 81% and specificity of 89%, with overall accuracy of 85% for detecting large vessel occlusion. This addition of the LAM severity scale also brings Maryland into alignment with the proposed COMPASS project National EMS Performance Benchmark, once again putting Maryland on the cutting edge of patient care. Interestingly, recent literature has demonstrated the benefit of endovascular therapy in a certain subset of patients with severe strokes affecting the anterior circulation of the brain. Endovascular therapies include clot-directed intraarterial TPA, which differs from systemic intravenous TPA, and clot retrieval with a wire device and placement of a vascular stent, similar to treatment for an acute myocardial infarction. The challenge is to identify those patients who will most benefit from endovascular therapies because less than a handful of stroke centers may be capable of 24-7 endovascular therapy. The purpose of this addition to the stroke assessment process is to assist EMS providers in identification of these patients. While the Cincinnati scale has high sensitivity for identifying any patient with a stroke, it does not have high specificity for identifying patients with large vessel anterior strokes needing endovascular therapy. Therefore, providers will now use the LAM scale to assist with identification of large vessel anterior stroke after a patient has ruled in with the Cincinnati scale. At this time, the protocol does not direct EMS providers to transport stroke patients with concern for large vessel anterior stroke to endovascular capable centers. 
Let's now talk about how you put these two scores into practice during your next shift. When your assessment identifies a patient with the presentation of a possible stroke, you will first apply the Cincinnati scale, which screens for three abnormalities, facial droop, arm drift, and slurred speech. Ask the patient to smile, tell the patient to raise both arms and look for weakness, and ask the patient to repeat a simple phrase and listen to the quality of their speech. If the patient has any positive findings on the Cincinnati scale, then apply the LAMB scale, which grades the severity of three abnormalities, facial droop, arm drift, and grip strength. If the patient has a score of four or greater on the LAMB scale, you should be concerned for large vessel anterior stroke, which may benefit from endovascular therapy. Let's take a look at how we score the LAMB scale. Facial droop, absent, zero, present, one, arm drift, Absent, zero. Drifts down, one. Falls rapidly, two. Grip strength, normal, zero. Weak grip, one. No grip, two. Patients who have a LAMS of four or greater are seven times more likely to have a large vessel occlusion. Finally, the Cincinnati stroke assessment and the LAMS is not 100% sensitive and specific for a stroke. It's important to remember that a patient with a posterior circulation stroke may only present with dizziness or blurred vision. If you have a sudden onset of single eye loss of vision, blurred vision, or dizziness, consider taking the patient to a primary stroke center. A new addition to the Maryland Medical Protocols in 2016 is sepsis for adult and pediatric patients. Joining us is Dr. Tim Chismar, MIMS Region 3 Medical Director, Jurisdictional Medical Director, Hartford County Fire and EMS, and the University of Maryland Upper Chesapeake Health EMS Medical Director to help you understand exactly how a sepsis patient presents and how to treat the patient. Hello. I'm here today to introduce two items being added to the protocols this year for the treatment of sepsis by Maryland pre-hospital providers. Due to the significant differences between the adult and pediatric versions, we will first discuss some of the background information and then consider adult sepsis, followed by the differences between it and the pediatric version. Let me begin by answering why sepsis should be important to pre-hospital providers. The frequency of sepsis as the primary cause of a patient's chief complaint for a 911 call is higher than that of many other life-threatening emergencies, such as cardiac arrest, STEMI, or stroke. Patients presenting with severe sepsis or septic shock also have higher mortality rates than patients suffering from STEMI, stroke, or even serious trauma. If EMS providers are seeing septic patients more often than other common life-threatening conditions, and it has at least the same mortality rate, if not higher, it should be clear it's important that we have the tools to identify and treat these patients aggressively. Early research is showing that with early identification and aggressive fluid therapy, EMS providers can dramatically lower the mortality rate for septic patients. Now that we've discussed the importance of this new protocol, we need to define what sepsis is. While a complete description of the pathophysiology is beyond the scope of this presentation, sepsis can be compared in a very broad sense to anaphylaxis a condition that EMS providers are already familiar with. During anaphylaxis, the body undergoes an exaggerated response due to an exposure to an allergen such as a medication or food. During sepsis, an infection gains access to the bloodstream and the body's immune system responds in an exaggerated and aggressive way to try and get rid of the infectious particles, which are most often bacteria. This inflammatory response leads to numerous physiological changes the most concerning being cellular hypoperfusion and shock. Unlike anaphylaxis, however, the body's response is much more complex. So simple treatment with sympathomimetics, like epinephrine, are not sufficient to reverse the effects of sepsis. The onset of sepsis is also not sudden. Typically, patients will begin with a localized infection or cold, then progress to sepsis, followed by an increasingly rapid progression to severe sepsis, and finally septic shock. Maryland pre-hospital sepsis protocols aim to identify the most serious of these patients, such as those in severe sepsis or septic shock. Now we will get into the specifics of the new protocols. 
The overall goal of both the adult and pediatric sepsis protocols is early identification, aggressive fluid therapy with lactated ringers, and an early notification of a sepsis alert to the receiving hospital. The most challenging of these three components is identification. Unfortunately, there is no single vital sign or test that will indicate that a patient is septic, and even in the hospital setting, this can be difficult to accurately diagnose in these patients. For adult patients, Maryland EMS providers will use a modified version of the Systemic Inflammatory Response Syndrome, or SIRS, criteria. These are vital signs that are consistent with an inflammatory response by the body. If an adult patient has a suspected source of infection and at least two of the criteria indicated in this chart, they should be suspected of being septic and treated with this protocol. One item to highlight is that in the setting of an infection, a fever is the single most specific pre-hospital vital sign we have for diagnosing the septic patient. It is therefore very important that EMS providers obtain temperatures for any patient that they suspect may be septic. Be cautious of relying only on a fever, however, as a significant fraction of septic patients will present afebrile or even hypothermic. Pre-hospital providers who strongly suspect sepsis in an adult patient who does not meet the inclusion criteria outlined here may utilize medical consultation to obtain approval to treat a patient using this protocol. Many of your monitors will calculate a mean arterial pressure for you. It is important to remember how to calculate the MAP by using this formula. Once an adult patient has qualified for this protocol, EMS providers should initiate a large bore peripheral IV. If IV access is unobtainable and there is an extended transport time, or if the patient is exhibiting signs of significant altered mental status or hypotension, suggesting septic shock, IO access should be considered. A new concept being introduced this year with this protocol is the optional standing order for initiating a second IV. For a priority one septic patient, providers should strongly consider initiation of a second IV if it will not delay transport. The second line will assist EMS with providing the large amounts of fluid we will discuss next and allow the hospital multiple access points for medication administration. After IV initiation, Maryland EMS providers will then begin a two liter bolus of lactated ringers making sure to reevaluate the patient at least every 500 milliliters for signs of fluid overload. This may sound like a significant amount of fluid, but remember that due to underlying sepsis, there is the potential for significant vasodilation leading to hypoperfusion and shock, and that the majority of this fluid will exit the vascular space and enter the interstitial spaces within an hour of administration. For extended transports and patients continuing to exhibit signs and symptoms after this first bolus, medical consultation may be obtained to provide more fluid, up to 30 milliliters per kilogram in an hour, and ALS providers may consult for dopamine at the 2 to 20 mic per kilo per minute dose. For fluid-sensitive adult patients, such as those with a history of CHF or end-stage renal failure, the treatment is very much the same, with only the amount of fluids provided being modified. EMS providers should provide up to two 250 milliliter lactated ringer boluses, carefully monitoring for fluid overload. Remember that even though these patients are volume sensitive, if they are septic, they are also fluid deprived. While careful administration is important, do not withhold lactated ringers from these patients unless they are showing signs of fluid overload as well. The last portion of this protocol is early notification. All septic patients should be treated as priority one or two, and the receiving hospital shall be notified prior to arrival with the term sepsis alert used during the notification. Now we will discuss the pediatric sepsis protocol and highlight the differences between it and the adult version. Identification of the pediatric septic patient can be especially challenging. Often, it is difficult to obtain a history or get information from the patient detailing how they are feeling due to their young age. Fortunately, there are some high-risk criteria that can aid pre-hospital providers in identifying these patients. Most pediatric sepsis patients will be young, under one year of age, or have one of the following high-risk factors. Altered mental status, asplenia, the spleen has been removed from treatment of trauma or illness, bone marrow or solid organ transplant, cancer patients, cerebral palsy, 
sickle cell disease, central or indwelling catheters, immunodeficiency or immunosuppression, bedridden or severe mental delay. EMS providers should have a high index of suspicion for sepsis if a patient meets any of these criteria. Similar to adults, we will utilize a modification of the SERS criteria to identify pediatric sepsis patients. But unlike in adults, there are some physical exam findings that can be used as part of the inclusion criteria. To be eligible for this protocol, a pediatric patient, defined as a patient not yet reaching his or her 18th birthday, must have a suspected source of infection and at least three of the following age-adjusted vital signs. As with adults, if an EMS provider suspects that a patient who does not meet the criteria is septic, the provider may contact a pediatric base station for consultation to treat a patient with this protocol. Another key exam finding to note is that septic children are at elevated risk for hypoglycemia. Any pediatric patient suspected of having sepsis should have his or her blood sugar checked. Conversely, a pediatric patient with no prior history of diabetes who presents with hypoglycemia should be carefully evaluated for sepsis. Once identified, the septic pediatric patient will be divided into one of two categories based on the presenting vital signs and physical exam. Unlike adult septic patients who all receive treatment, pediatric septic patients are only treated if they're at high risk for septic shock. Pediatric patients who qualify for the protocol based on the criteria in the white boxes only, containing heart rate, respiratory rate, temperature, and capillary refill, are at high risk for sepsis or severe sepsis, but at a lower risk for septic shock. These patients should receive supportive care only and transport to a local emergency department with early notification of sepsis alert prior to EMS arrival. These patients are still sick and require transport, but they may benefit from being evaluated by a physician prior to receiving aggressive therapy. EMS providers may treat these patients with pre-hospital fluid if approved by a pediatric base station consultation. Pediatric sepsis patients who have at least one of the shaded inclusion criteria on the bottom are at high risk of septic shock and should be treated aggressively by EMS providers with standing order fluid therapy. For these high risk patients, ALS providers should initiate an IV or IO and provide 20 milliliters per kilogram of lactated ringers over five to 20 minutes, along with other standard ALS care. Prior to arrival at the hospital, consultation with the receiving facility and pediatric base station should be obtained and the term sepsis alert shall be used. For lengthy transports, medical consultation may be obtained to provide a second and third 20 milliliters per kilogram bolus of lactated ringers, up to a maximum of 60 milliliters per kilogram in one hour. Patients who are still symptomatic after three boluses of lactated ringers are eligible for dopamine with pediatric base station consultation. In summary, sepsis is a complicated medical condition that is not easy to identify. For the adult patient, Maryland EMS providers should utilize vital signs to look for indications of an immune response indicating evidence of sepsis. If a patient meets the criteria, they should receive aggressive fluid therapy with one or two IVs and early notification to the receiving hospital of a sepsis alert. Similarly, pediatric septic patients are identified with age-adjusted vital signs and physical exam findings. Pediatric patients at low risk for septic shock are monitored in the pre-hospital setting with early notification to the receiving hospital of a sepsis alert. Pediatric patients at high risk for septic shock, as indicated by the shaded inclusion criteria, should receive aggressive pre-hospital fluid therapy as well as early notification and consultation with both the receiving facility and a pediatric base station. Remember, any patient, adult or pediatric, may be treated with this protocol without meeting the specified criteria with medical consultation approval. Also consider that many of these septic patient calls will originate at dispatch with a relatively mundane sounding chief complaint of sick patient or altered labs and will often receive an initial BLS response. With careful physical exams, however, Maryland EMS providers can identify these extremely sick patients and dramatically improve their prognoses using the new tools presented here.
In previous years, EMS providers in the state of Maryland have had to keep track of over 30 age groupings throughout the medical protocols. However, after the hard work of the Pediatric Emergency Medical Advisory Council, that number has been reduced to eight pediatric and two adult age groupings starting in July of 2016. Changes to the communications section of the general patient care were also made to Maryland medical protocols for EMS providers. And here to explain how the ages have been revised and to review some key treatment points for pediatric patients and communications is Dr. Jennifer Anders with the Department of Pediatric Emergency Medicine at the Johns Hopkins Hospital. In an effort to improve appropriate management of the pediatric patient and align that care with the developmental categories of children, the Pediatric Emergency Medical Advisory Council has completed a comprehensive review of the Maryland medical protocols for EMS providers. They were able to identify over 30 different age ranges or groups for pediatric patients, which would be a challenge for any EMS provider or physician to keep straight, and simplified it down to just eight. The Protocol Review Committee and EMS Board adopted these eight age group categories and have applied them throughout the protocols. These eight age groups are as follows. Newly born, up to one hour of age. Neonate, one hour to 28 days. Infant, greater than 28 days, up to one year. Toddler, one year, up to two years. Preschooler, two to four years. School age, 5 to 12 years. Adolescent, 13 up to the 18th birthday. And a pediatric trauma patient remains one who is less than 15 years of age. You will notice that each age group is assigned a specific developmental description. Each of these dis developmental descriptions aligns with not only an age grouping for quick reference, but also helps you as EMS providers to recall key features associated with that stage of child development and abilities. So how do these age groups impact your ability to take care of and treat your pediatric patient? First, let's look at the protocol symbol key. The pediatric bear will continue to be a guide to the pediatric section of a specific treatment or procedure. Second, let's look at the general patient care provision that applies throughout the protocols to medical treatment. This provides all EMS providers with the general principles that will identify and categorize trauma versus medical and pediatric versus adult patients. It reads, pediatric section of the treatment protocol will be used for children who have not reached their 15th birthday for trauma or their 18th birthday for medical, except as otherwise stated in the treatment protocol. The medication dosing provision reads as follows. Pediatric doses apply to patients weighing less than 50 kilograms. For pediatric patients equal to or greater than 50 kilograms, utilize adult dosing. The core message here is that the pediatric trauma center cutoff remains the same, not yet reached 15th birthday. Also, the medication dosing standards for our pediatrics is weight based in kilograms and has not changed. If anything, the pediatric dosing by age selections has been reduced so please thoroughly review the 2016 Maryland Medical Protocols for EMS Providers for the medications you're most likely to use for your patients and make sure you're familiar with the dosing. The next statement is simple but very important to understand. The developmental age of the infant or child must be considered in the communication and evaluation for treatment. This means that you need to apply the normal values for this age group, such as expected vital signs, whether they should be crawling, walking, and expected verbal skills and behaviors when you assess and treat a pediatric patient. A toddler who is crying after a fall and not answering questions is behaving as we normally expect. A preschooler who doesn't want to talk to EMS personnel but is communicating with their parent is behaving as we normally expect. Age plays a factor in your destination determination, as does the patient's medical conditions and history. In an effort to get patients to the best destination for their underlying disease process, PMAC and MIMS empowered you to reach out to the pediatric base stations for patients who are 18 years or older and followed by a pediatric specialist. The protocol states, destination consideration. For those patients who are 18 years of age or older who receive specialized care at a pediatric facility, consider medical consultation with a pediatric base station for patient destination. You will note that the new upper limit of not reach their 18th birthday for pediatric patients. This is not a hard rule, 
as some pediatric patients who have serious underlying diseases are still followed by pediatric specialists. And the nearest appropriate facility for these patients may be the pediatric specialty hospital where their medical records and physician specialists are located. Completing the general patient care pediatric section, I want to reinforce that infants and children must be properly restrained prior to and during transport. It's your responsibility to appropriately restrain pediatric patients and not allow them to be transported in their parents' arms. A hard break alone can cause the child, as well as the parent, to become a projectile. Put them in an appropriate safety seat or child stretcher device to secure them and protect them from harm. Finally, the protocol states, when appropriate, family members should remain with pediatric patients. Parental presence oftentimes is essential for keeping the infant or child calm and provides the parent the opportunity to assist in patient management. Again, make sure both parent and child are properly restrained. If the child is in extremis and you need the area for EMS caregivers, then place the parent in the front seat so they can hear and see how hard you're working and will not be recklessly following you in their private vehicles. The parent can also provide you with potentially life-saving instruction or guidance particularly for children with unusual or chronic diseases. The next modification within the general patient care section of the protocols is under the communication section. It reads as follows. Communications with and through EMRC Syscom are recorded. In addition, as part of the quality assurance and quality improvement process, communications with hospitals are frequently recorded. Therefore, you should assume that all your communications among EMS providers, hospitals, public safety communication centers, and EMRC Syscom are being recorded. All Priority One patients require online medical consultation through EMRC on a recorded line, radio or phone. An alert has been included here that reads, any patient that the provider identifies as meeting any specialty alert, for example, trauma, STEMI alert, stroke alert, sepsis alert, requires an online medical consultation through EMRC on a recorded line, radio or phone. All Priority 2 patients who have persistent symptoms or need further therapeutic interventions require online medical consultation through EMRC on a recorded line, radio or phone. It is essential that you communicate in a professional and effective way while on the radio. On average, 30,000 people are listening to their scanners at any given time. Your communication to the hospital should be focused on patient care and providing the information that the hospital staff needs to give you appropriate medical direction and also so they can prepare to meet the needs of your patient. All these communications are recorded for quality assurance purposes, which can be translated to mean that Dr. Alcorda can and will be hearing my report. When you have a time-sensitive or critical patient, it meets one of the alert criteria, such as STEMI alert, stroke alert, sepsis alert, or trauma alert. Please use the specific alert up front in your report. The hospital staff want and need this information so they can trigger in-house teams, open up the CT scanner, or warm up cath labs. Do not wait until you are a minute from the hospital door. The earlier you can provide this alert, the better for the patient. In summary, there are eight pediatric descriptions and age groups. They are newly born, up to one hour, neonate, one hour to 28 days old, infant, greater than 28 days to one year, toddler, one year to less than two years, preschooler, two to four years, school age, five to 12 years, adolescent, 13 up to the 18th birthday, and pediatric trauma remains children less than 15 years of age. You need to be familiar with the description name and the features that are associated with each age group. Review the protocols so you'll be familiar with the new relative upper limit of not reached their 18th birthday for pediatric medical patients. The upper limit of not yet reached their 15th birthday for trauma patients has not changed. For medication dosing, children less than 50 kilograms shall receive milligram per kilogram dosing, and those over 50 kilograms should receive adult dosing. Please call the pediatric base station for medical direction for patients over 18 who have an underlying disease followed by pediatric specialists, for guidance on dosing, and for advice on management of unusual pediatric patients. Always appropriately restrain pediatric patients and parents and do not transport the pediatric patient in the parent's arms. 
Always try to transport the parent with the infant or child. It's better for the patient and the parent. Remember that Dr. Alcorta is listening on those recorded radio and phone lines. Be professional and be effective in your communications. Call with early notification of time critical disease using the appropriate alerts. Please place your alert statement up front in your report and state it clearly. You are saving valuable organ tissue and are likely saving a life. You all make me proud to be a part of the Maryland EMS system as you're saving lives every day. Being able to assist with the birth of a child can be both exhilarating and stressful for the EMS provider. For 2016, the newly born protocol has been revised to include the most up-to-date and best practices and to help make this event go as smoothly as possible for the provider and both patients, mother and infant. Here to discuss the changes is Webra Price Douglas, coordinator of the Maryland Regional Neonatal Transport Program. Babies are born every day, approximately 4 million a year nationwide, and about 11% of these babies are premature. Most often, births go smoothly, but 10% of the time, the baby will need some support during delivery and in the first few minutes, and 1% will require neonatal resuscitation. The 2016 changes in the MEMS protocol refocus the EMS care on the 90% that go well, what to do and what not to do, and how to be gentle and patient. This is a normal process. Maryland EMS for Children Department and the State Office of Commercial Ambulance Licensure and Regulation have just completed a two-year cycle offering the Neonatal Resuscitation Program, or NRP, standardized course from the American Academy of Pediatrics. Based on the resuscitation recommendations from the NRP course, and the 2015 American Heart Association guidelines for cardiac care, the following changes have been incorporated into the 2016 Maryland EMS protocols. The first and most significant change occurs in both BLS and ALS care during the first minute and first 10 minutes of the transitional life for the newly born. Evidence-based practice in the delivery room and the emergency room when needed has shown that the alert and responsive newly born infant does not need to have oxygen support during the first 10 minutes of life. In fact, it's normal for the infant's oxygenation level to slowly increase as they adjust to room air with 21% oxygen. This simple chart lists the targets for oxygenation. This makes most providers uncomfortable. Be patient. This is part of the normal transition to extrauterine life. During this time, the EMS provider should follow the inverted triangle and dry the baby off and get more dry towels. Warm the baby near the mother. Position baby with the mother, ideally skin to skin, and airway in neutral position. Use the mother as a heat source. If the baby shows interest in breastfeeding, encourage the baby to breastfeed at this time. Stimulate the baby if necessary. Remember that these steps were for an alert and responsive newly born infant who may not be pink yet, but will get more color as it transitions from intrauterine life to extrauterine life. If the newly born infant is not alert and vigorous, EMS providers should continue down the inverted pyramid of resuscitation. In summary, the changes in the 2016 protocols include the following. An alert has been added to the BLS and ALS newly born protocols to remind providers that AED is not recommended in infants less than 24 hours old. Infant CPR with both compressions and ventilations are the standard of care. Suction has been removed from the top level of the inverted pyramid and is reserved for caring for the non-vigorous infant. Throughout the protocol document, the definition of newly born has been made consistent and reads the infant within the first hour after delivery. Within the ALS protocol for newly born resuscitation, the threshold for treating hypoglycemia is consistently defined at 30 
milligrams per deciliter. Here are some additional reminders in the care of newly born infants, though these are not changes in the 2016 protocols. Premature infants less than 32 weeks gestation will likely require ongoing bag valve mass ventilations due to immature lungs. Newly born infants receive 10% dextrose, two to four milliliters per kilo, IV or IO. 10% dextrose is prepared by mixing one part of 50% dextrose with four parts lactated ringers. Newly born infants are considered volume sensitive and resuscitation fluids are calculated using the formula of 10 milliliters per kilogram. This is based on estimated weight, which can be difficult to calculate in the out-of-hospital environment. In an attempt to make post-cardiac arrest care management easier to follow, a formal return of spontaneous circulation protocol has been developed for implementation in July 2016. This protocol includes the use of amniodarone and neuroprotective hypothermia with a target destination of a cardiac interventional center. If you have not had the opportunity to document a cardiac arrest call, you may not have noticed the new cardiac arrest registry to enhance survival, CARES, field in the cardiac arrest tab in eMeds. As you learned during the 2015 protocol rollout, MIMS has partnered with CARES. The trial period has ended and the program is now live statewide. Let's view a demonstration of the incorporation of high performance CPR during the treatment of a cardiac arrest. Following the demonstration, we will be joined by Dr. Richard Alcorta, the State EMS Medical Director, to discuss the documentation of a cardiac arrest patient in eMeds. John, I'm gonna head on to work now. Okay. Are you okay? You don't look good. I, I, I don't feel good. It's so hot in here and I'm, my chest is tight. Are I'm having sure? trouble getting my breath and my arm is killing me. Oh, John, no. John, John, please get up. Are you okay? John, John. Tell me, Kenley, 911, what's the address of your emergency? 301 Bay Street, Easton. 301 Bay Street. Okay, and your phone number you're calling from? 410-822-1799. Okay, and what's the problem? Tell me exactly what happened. Uh, my husband, I think he had a heart attack. Okay, how old is he? 64. Is he, is he awake? No. Is he breathing? No. Is there an AED or a defibrillator available? No. Okay. Okay, I'm sending the paramedics now to help you. Stay on the line and I'll tell you exactly what to do. Medical box 60, station 60, medical assist, paramedic 90, EMS 2, cardiac arrest, 301 Bay Street, Cross Street, Northwest Street, and Hammond Street. I'm going to give you some instructions. Get to the front as close as possible. Don't hang up. Do it now and tell me when it's done. Okay. Okay, listen carefully. Lay him flat on his back on the ground and remove any pillows. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and give you some CPR instructions, okay? Place the heel of the hand on the breastbone right between the nipples. Put your other hand on top of that hand. Pump the chest hard and fast at least twice per second and two inches deep. Let the chest come up all the way between pumps. We're going to do this 600 times or until help arrives. Count out loud so I can count with you. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six, twenty-seven, twenty-eight. 
Hi, ma'am. Can you please stop compressions for a minute? Did the patient injure himself when he fell? No, he didn't. He did not. Okay. Can you start compressions again? Utility 60 to engine 64, paramedic 90, EMS 2, confirm cardiac arrest. Thank you, ma'am. Ma'am, they'll take I over. I can take over from here. Okay. Can you come with me so I can get some more information on your husband? Okay. okay. Coming in behind you. Y'all continue CPR with chest compression. You want to continue with high performance? Here's up. How's your compliance with the ventilation? Very good. Compliance? Have good compliance. Good. Okay. okay, I've got the pads attached. Continue CPR. While it is analyzing, I need y'all to switch positions. We got to keep that 100 to 120 okay. compressions for that high performance CPR. I'm analyzing Analyze. switch positions. Stand clear. Analyzing now. Stand if it's a shock indicated while it's charging, I need you to continue. Shock advised. Okay, you continue high performance CPR while we're waiting for it to charge. Continuing compressions. Stand clear. Push to shock. Clear. Okay, I'm going to be shocking. Everyone clear? I'm clear. You're clear. Shock. Okay, back on the chest. I'm going to time you. For two minutes, we want good quality CPR. Okay, continue CPR. You've got 45 more seconds. Keep up that rate and depth. Keep it going, keep it going. Good job. Hey guys, Paramag 90, what do we got? Hey, we have a 54-year-old male. Earlier today was complaining of some chest pain, left shoulder pain. At that point in time, he collapsed. There's no trauma associated with it. Spouse started CPR on the scene. First responders came in. So far, we have shot once. We have good compliance and continuing high performance CPR. Okay, let's get them hooked up to our monitor. Bill, can I get you to start IO for me? Okay, we have 15 seconds left. Okay, I'm going to pre charge. Continue CPR. Okay. We're at two minutes. Okay, I need you to back off the chest so we can analyze the rhythm. I have V-fib. Is everybody clear? I'm clear, you clear, everybody clear? Shock device. Okay, I'll take over compressions for you. We're gonna continue CPR. Okay, we're doing compressions now. Remember, we have to start back compressions to get adequate circulation because we don't always get it after a shock. We're going to get them on a nasal capnography so we can monitor the uh, ventilations and compressions. EMS 2 is on the scene. Becky, what do we have? We have a capnography reading of 43. Oh, that's great news. That's indicative of a return of spontaneous circulation. Let me finish my two minutes of CPR. Then we can assess to see if we have a perfusing sinus rhythm. Okay, we have 15 seconds left. I'm going to pre-charge. All right, um, Mary Alice, I need you to step up our hands off the chest. We have enormous size rhythm. I'm going to decharge the monitor. Do we have a pulse, TC? Yes, we have a pulse. Okay, is he uh, understanding commands? Sir. Sir, no commands. Mary Alice, can I get you to get a blood pressure on him? Okay. Becky, it appears we have ROSC. We have a blood pressure of 114 over 62, pulse rate of 72, O2 sats of 96%. What would you like to do now? I'm going to go ahead and intubate him. I'm going to have Mary Alice go ahead and start neuroprotective hypothermia. 
Bill, can you grab me some ice bags? We want to go on and put bilaterally some on his groin, some in his axilla, and then some around his neck because he's got a GCS less than eight. He's over the age of 18. He's unresponsive and we're going to be intubating him. Bill, let's go ahead and prepare the 150 milligrams of amiodarone. Go ahead and administer that IO over a 10 minute period. We'll go ahead and prepare the patient for transport. We'll be transporting to PRMC since that is our closest cardiac interventional facility and we'll do a consult and route. What you've just watched is a multifaceted cardiac arrest that could be a real life situation. Let's review the overall stages of this event we just watched. First, an out of hospital cardiac arrest occurred and 911 was called immediately to start the chain of survival. Once connected with the 911 dispatch center, the operator recognized the arrest and immediately started the cardiac arrest tools within the dispatch application. At this time, units were being alerted and the family members started resuscitative efforts. Then, the first unit that was on scene was a member of the fire department who was a first aid slash CPR trained individual. They took over CPR efforts and traded positions with the family member. During this time, the volunteer attempted to gather limited information as to what happened while also noting what he was seeing on scene, including who was doing CPR. The next arriving unit on location was a BLS certified unit with the providers and an AED. Crews doing CPR were switched out and the AED was immediately placed on the patient while compressions were still in progress. Once the AED was placed, it was recognized that this was a shockable rhythm and the AED went through the steps to shock the patient. During this time, passed down information was given from the first arriving volunteer to the BLS crew. During this transition, the BLS crew implemented crew member assignments and was performing high performance CPR, rotating every two minutes according to the timekeeper. The final unit that arrived had ALS providers in the transport unit. Once on scene, patient care was transferred to the ALS providers. During this time, ALS interventions were started and the patient was placed on the monitor. The patient is shocked a second time and return of spontaneous circulation is achieved. The patient is given amiodarone and neuroprotective hypothermia is initiated. The patient is packaged and transported to the hospital. The highest level provider needs to record all events that happened in order to document all care provided before EMS arrived and the EMS care provided to the patient. This information will then be in the complete record that is delivered to the hospital and to the National Cardiac Arrest Registry for Enhanced Survival or CARES. While ALS is en route to the call, dispatch may have advised the unit of the information that was available to them at the time. Once on scene, the crew members who arrived before them should efficiently pass down all the necessary information, including the following. One, other than the transporting unit, which dispatch unit was the first to arrive on scene? Two, was the arrest witnessed and who witnessed the arrest? Three, how long was the patient in arrest until an EMS unit arrived on scene? Four, what was the presumed cardiac etiology and was the arrest a trauma-related one? Five, were resuscitative efforts completed and what type was performed? Six, who first initiated CPR efforts for the patient? Seven, Prior to the transporting ambulance arriving on scene, was an AED attached to the patient? Eight, who first attached the AED to the patient? Nine, 
Who first shocked the patient? 10. Was there an AED available prior to the arrival of EMS? 11. Prior to the arrival of EMS, was the AED used and was return of spontaneous circulation achieved? 12. How long was CPR performed prior to the arrival of the ALS provider? 13. What was the first measured rhythm of the patient with AED attached? 14. Was there any return of spontaneous circulation? 15. Was there any sustained return of spontaneous circulation? 16. If return of spontaneous circulation was achieved, was hypothermic care provided in the field? 17. When the patient was transported to the hospital, what was the patient's rhythm? 18. What is the end of this event once care was transferred to the hospital staff? 19. What was the approximate time that the patient went into cardiac arrest? 20. What was the time that the first shock was delivered? 21. What time did CPR start? Remember, your documentation is important. Your documentation is the written legal record of the incident from beginning to end and will become part of the patient's permanent medical record. This documentation will be provided to the counties, the state, and the National Cares Registry. By providing accurate and complete patient care reports, we can measure our success and improve our efforts in saving lives. Emergency medical services is an ever-changing field. We've gone from a simple load and go thinking to now staying on scene for a cardiac arrest to do high performance CPR. Ideology and practices changed and there is evidence behind those changes that act as the driving force. That evidence is provided to healthcare professionals through the documentation done by all providers. It is because of this our electronic Maryland EMS data system, eMeds, must change and adapt in order to help providers and to gather new information. I'd like to go over some of those changes that you have seen in eMeds. These changes were presented to MIMS from a variety of sources, the majority of which come from you, the providers. They have been vetted and approved to be made effective in our current system by the EMED statewide steering committee. One, last year we changed the question, resuscitation attempted. Two, what type of resuscitation was attempted by EMS in order to clarify exactly what is being asked of the provider? Two, in the question, who initiated CPR, the available selections of responding EMS personnel was changed to EMS, transporting unit personnel, and first responder non-EMS to non-transporting fire EMS unit. We've also added law enforcement as a choice. By adding choices and changing the wording, we hope the question is easier to read and understand. Three, we've added the field of last known well time, which is triggered when meets stroke alert is equal to yes. This is a vital timestamp that is necessary in the treatment for a patient experiencing a stroke. Four, we have added validation requiring that medications are documented when a patient is transported by EMS. Five, Additional validation was added to prompt the provider to enter who gave a medication to the patient and what the response was to that medication. It is important to know if our interventions are helping the patient or if they have not improved the condition that was first noted. Six, a significant validation rule has also been added to the transport tab. 
When the user documents diversion as how the destination was determined, the field of facility diverted from will become validated. This will assist hospital representatives in determining that a patient was unable to be transported to their facility due to their alert status. Seven, we've changed the labels of two questions that were attempting to gather the same information and may have caused confusion. Under the response times section and the transport tab, you previously saw release patient care to hospital and transfer of patient care to hospital off stretcher time. Both of these fields are linked to the same coded question. So by completing one, you also completed the other. This question is now labeled as transfer of care complete. The EMED steering committee wanted to make it clear that the two parts of the patient care handoff the medical care report from the EMS agency to the receiving facility and the physical transfer of the patient off the EMS stretcher were completed and documented. I want to also provide you with a look into the future of EMEDS. Many of you have been through several electronic patient care reporting system changes. The two recent changes included the MIMS homegrown EMEI system and the recent EMEDS image trend system with National EMS Information System, NEMSIS 2.2.1 version. Each of these implementations required extensive preparation and training of our EMS providers. The National Highway Transportation and Safety Administration and NEMSIS are transitioning to the NEMSIS version 3.4 data dictionary, data submission, and will no longer be accepting NEMSIS 2.2.1 data sets from states as of January 1, 2017, which is just around the corner. At the same time, ImageTrend has an enhanced platform called Elite, which has multiple features that jurisdictional leaders want to have in place. The Elite platform will not use the current page layout for the state bridge and the field bridge. MIMS, through the EMED Steering Committee, has defined the mandatory and required NEMSIS 3.4 data dictionary for Maryland and has a page layout committee comprised of EMS providers that is tasked with building the most user-friendly data entry pages possible. This fall, it's essential that every EMS provider become proficient in the use of the new EMED's Elite platform and the new NEMSIS 3.4 data entry system before Maryland goes live with this system. So please pay close attention to the jurisdictional requirements to meet this training standard. Safety is a paramount concern to EMS administrators, supervisors, and providers. Making sure we deliver our patients safely to the hospital and ensuring we are able to return for the next call for service is everyone's responsibility. There have been several statewide conferences on ambulance safety, which overwhelmingly support six recommendations that could save your life. Here to discuss some things we can do to help make everyone safer from Region 3, is CRTI Bill Dusa from Abingdon Fire Company, who is also chair of the MSFA EMS Committee. Greetings. I am the current chairman of the MSFA's EMS Committee and the chair of the Statewide Ambulance Safety Task Force Subcommittee. The Statewide Ambulance Safety Task Force has been meeting for over five years and has three subcommittees, education, driver issues, and operations. These subcommittees have established six important recommendations that can save the lives of our patients, the public, and us. The cornerstone of these recommendations is the development of a culture of safety in which each and every one of us is responsible for reducing our risk of injury, delivering safe EMS care. The average occupation has a fatality rate of five per 100,000 workers. The police and related protective services have a fatality rate of 10.8 for 100,000 workers. EMS personnel in the U.S. 
have a fatality rate of 12.7 per 100,000 workers. What you do is dangerous. Maryland has more than one ambulance crash per day. So what can we do to prevent crashes from happening and killing patients, the public, and providers? None of us ever want to be to the driver responsible for any one of these crashes, but every time we get behind the wheel, we are at risk. The first recommendation from the task force is to screen ambulance drivers. Jurisdictions and companies should implement initial periodic driver screening to identify drivers whose driving records, excessive risk taking, or medical conditions may make them poor candidates for the responsibility of driving an ambulance. Driving an ambulance is not a right. It needs to be earned and the skills need to be continually maintained. If you drive recklessly or under the influence of drugs or alcohol in your personal vehicle, this will reflect very poorly on your ability to perform safely under stressful and dynamic emergency situations. Many of us believe that the majority of ambulance crashes are caused by civilian vehicles doing something wrong. I regret to inform you that over 50% of the at-fault drivers were EMS. Of those drivers involved in an ambulance crash, 44% were found to have multiple motor vehicle citations in their recent three-year driving history. The second recommendation is comprised of three parts that center on emergency vehicle operations courses and training that is available to our new and seasoned EMS drivers. 2A, ensure effective ambulance driver training, periodic refresher training, ambulance specific training should be uniformly required by jurisdictions and available for ambulance drivers in Maryland. Does your EMS service or ambulance company have a formal process for assuring that new and seasoned drivers are trained and refreshed on EVOC training skills? Many of my peers tell me that they learned how to drive ambulances by the seat of their pants and not in an EVOC, EVOC course or refresher driver training program. 2B, Maryland's EVOC training site should consider modifying EVOC courses to include ambulance specific didactic instruction modules, practical skill training that includes driving training and testing on different road types, and refresher training, including the use of driving simulators to allow ambulance drivers to update skills and knowledge. Many of you have heard of the military slogan, train like you will fight and fight like you were trained. Many of you have completed an EVOC course and were trained on a pumper, utility, or something other than an ambulance. This does not provide for ambulance specific didactic or practical training on varied road conditions. This is an area for improvement in many of our current EVOC programs across Maryland. This training should also be uniform and credentialed across the state. 2C. Jurisdictions should implement, it, implement graduated driving responsibilities. Newly trained ambulance drivers need a graduated and ideally mentored driving skill transition. The graduated program is a critical and necessary adjunct to EVOC dri ambulance driver education courses. Newly trained drivers should learn to handle ambulances in non-emergent situations first before running lights and sirens, a situation in which they will be unfamiliar with the handling characteristics of the ambulance. A mentor or experienced driver should ride up front with a newly trained driver until they have demonstrated their safe and competent decision making and ability to handle the ambulance. To summarize the three-part second recommendation, EMS services should be the shining star of professionalism and competence with A, driving records, excessive risk taking or medical conditions screened annually, B, initial standardized and credentialed EVOC and refresher training under varied road conditions in an ambulance and not in a utility or a pumper. C, graduated mentored driving responsibilities to ensure competence before solo release. Number three, increase uses of restraints and safety improvements during ambulance operations. Jurisdictions and companies should set, monitor, and enforce policies that require the use of seat belts or restraints for all occupants and patients. Future ambulance purchases should ensure patient compartments are ergonomically structured to increase safety. Do any of you ride in the back of the ambulance with the patient? How many of you ride in the back with a seat belt on? Our data reports that 84% of you are not using seat belts in the patient compartment. 
If you are not wearing a seat belt, or if you did not have the patient properly restrained, this is what will happen. Which of these pro two providers are you going to be? The one on the right with the lap seat belt, or the one on the left who is the projectile? Let's talk for a minute about the design of the ambulance compartment. Many of us have ridden in a variety of ambulances, and every one of them is laid out with different cabinets, different floor plans, different restraint systems, different stretcher retaining devices, and different patient restraint systems. Like you, I initially thought these designs were tested to provide safe and effective use of space. Regrettably, very little testing is done, and the design and layout are subjective to the vendor and the purchaser of the unit. So become informed on what's safe and what's not safe when purchasing an ambulance. Here is an example of an unsafe design. Recommendation number four is something that we can all apply in everyday practices as EMS drivers. Reduce the incident of excessive ambulance speeds and lights and sirens. Jurisdictions and companies should ensure that response and transport policies reinforce the need for safety as a first priority and should tailor practices to the degree of urgency as determined by patient need. Is it not the first motto of medical care to do no harm? Truly time-critical emergencies are infrequent in EMS, and many systems reporting them as less than 10% or as low as 2% of all calls for service. Lights and sirens should be used with priority to patients only in exceptional circumstances, for example, the need for time-critical hospital care, and should be prohibited for priority three and priority four patients. Routine use of lights and sirens should be eliminated in both responses and transports. In an urban study of EMS, use of lights and sirens saved an average of 75 seconds per transport, and in a rural study, 230 seconds were saved per transport. Will that four minutes save a life, or will it cost a life? Maryland providers need to change the culture to one of safety first for all, and save lights and sirens for true life-threatening emergency. Number five, improve monitoring of ambulance safety issues and enforcement of safety practices. Jurisdictions and companies should develop written policies that foster increased ambulance safety and ensure the availability of accurate data needed for effectively monitoring of ambulance safety issues. Include formal reviews of ambulance crashes and near misses. Please restrain your patient and yourself correctly using the appropriate safety devices. Many lieutenants and captains adopt a policy of not moving the unit until every member of their crew is properly restrained. I applaud this safety first approach to leadership. You are sitting appropriately restrained in the patient compartment captain's chair. But check your patient. Is the patient restrained using only the two torso straps? Or maybe you even have the shoulder straps on the patient but they're not cinched tight. Is that enough? No, this is why. On average, not properly restrained, the patient will move 28 inches past the edge of the stretcher. The patient now has a head and neck injury, and the EMS provider has a fractured pelvis and damaged genitalia. Without the shoulder harness, the patient would have sailed even further, if not completely off the stretcher. A formal process to collect information on all serious ambulance crashes need to be instituted. Many think this is just to assess blame. It is not. As many of these safety devices and restraint systems have limited or no national standard testing, the only way we can learn what works and what doesn't work to save lives in the future is to collect this data. Please report all injury crashes to MIMS. The sixth and last recommendation focuses on moving the system to a true culture of safety from the leadership down. Number six, create and maintain ongoing statewide forum for ambulance safety issues. The statewide ambulance safety task force should continue to promote the, the advancement of ambulance safety, monitor trends in ambulance crashes, provide a forum for addressing future ambulance safety issues, including review of the updated NFPA 1917. There are many things we can each do to make our patients and ourselves safer. At your earliest opportunity, 
review or implement a new and refresher EVOC training, po training policy for your company. Talk with your chief officers about reviewing your company policy on driver motor vehicle administration history to reduce your crash risk and liability exposure. On your next run, please review the configuration of your current ambulance. Is everything secure? Are the cabinet designs a risk if you get hit from the front, the back, or the side? Please appropri appropriately restrain your patient and yourself every single time you get into your unit. Please be safe out there. Thank you. The occurrence of heroin overdoses and deaths in Maryland have grown horribly over the past several years. Last year, Governor Larry Hogan created the Heroin and Opioid Emergency Task Force to support efforts to address this growing crisis. The task force submitted its final report to the administration in December of 2015. This year, the governor introduced legislation that will help combat Maryland's heroin epidemic based on recommendations from the task force. Since we as EMS providers deal with calls for overdoses all the time, we should realize that we can also have a role in helping overcome this widespread epidemic. As we treat these patients, there is also an opportunity to make a difference in their lives. Research shows that people who overdosed are likely to overdose again. We can provide the patient with information that can guide them to help and rehabilitation services. Many local health departments have overdose response programs. Please listen as we hear the personal story from one of our own Maryland EMS providers and her family's loss. We're a middle class family that lives on a farm, that works hard, gives back to the community. We're active in the church. We're, you know, God fearing family. Um, unfortunately, that didn't matter. Um, where addiction is concerned, um, it didn't matter, and Nolan and I have been in the fire service for over 30 years. Um, all of our, our kids were raised in the fire service. I mean, all of our kids wandered around in the fire service as babies, as children, um, so they saw everything. Um, from the time that Nolan III was little, I mean, he loved fire engines, he loved, you know, all of that. You know, and ironically for him to finally die, you know, where he loved to hang out the most was just crazy. Crazy. The needle we found that night was a one cc syringe. So less than one cc killed our son of something. Less than one cc. I mean, when you think about that, you know, it's less than a teaspoon killed our son. And they just think that they can do it one time and then, you know, life goes back to normal. They don't realize that that one time is what changes everything for them. And it doesn't, you know, it, it doesn't just happen one time. It happens one time and then again and again and again and they become in denial themselves that they even have a problem. Um, statistics have shown that 90% of the people who use it the first time become addicted. And the other 10% if they use it a second time do. It's, you know, it's not like taking a drink. It's not like smoking a cigarette. It's not even like trying marijuana. It's not something you can take one time and walk away. You take heroin and you're pretty much addicted. Pretty much addicted. I don't think that I even knew up until the day that my brother died from a heroin overdose that the severity of the drug. I didn't understand. I, um, I thought, you know, it was going on in my own house and I, I didn't understand that this could kill him. I um, was very oblivious to the effects of it. But the thing of it is, is addiction doesn't just affect the attic. Um, it's sort of like when you throw a pebble in a, in a lake or in a pond. That ripple effect comes all the way into the shore. Well, the addiction affects the entire family. The entire family. Um, and when he was using, he wasn't the person that, you know, that we loved the most um, because the drug controlled him. And when he wasn't using, he was miserable. And now, now we're living a, living a nightmare, a nightmare caused innocently from our son being in an accident, getting on pain pills, and then escalating from there. 
Hello, my name is Sandy Gallion and I'm an EMT from Lovell Volunteer Fire Company in Harford County. Heroin overdoses and deaths have doubled over the last several years. Heroin is cheaper to buy than illicit pain pills. And mixed with other substances, the heroin available today is more potent than just a few years ago. It is also more readily available to those who suffer from the disease of addiction. This is not just an issue for cities. Suburbs and rural communities are hit just as hard, and addiction does not discriminate in race, sex, or social status. EMS deals with the acute overdose patient all too frequently. But as providers, we can also play an influential part to help overcome this epidemic. Addiction is a disease that creates a physical and psychological dependency that consumes all of that person's attention. This disease not only affects the addict, but also affects family and friends. I know this personally, as I lost my son to the disease of heroin addiction. Your compassion while treating that addicted patient goes a long way to help support not only the patient, but the family as well. This event is just as traumatic to the family, making them EMS patients as well. Remember, family members may have witnessed their loved one stop breathing. They may have had to administer naloxone to him or her. While it may be only supportive and compassionate care you provide to the family, it makes a huge difference in their lives. During the Addicted Patients EMS Encounter, you have the opportunity to provide a link to help them with recovery. Through your care and compassion, you can seize the moment to provide that patient with information that helps guide them to help. It is imperative to partner with your local health department and law enforcement to help combat this public health crisis. We must all play a part in the health of the community. Over the past five years, the Department of Homeland Security Blue Campaign has become a national leader on anti-trafficking training, creating and delivering high-quality human trafficking training across the country for federal, state, local, tribal, territorial, and campus law enforcement. MIMS wants you to team up with your public and private sector friends and partners in your community to ensure that important information about human trafficking is being shared with individuals, families, and communities from the truck stops along our nation's highways to the home. The Department of Homeland Security has implemented a nationwide public awareness campaign displaying awareness materials in 13 major U.S. airports, creating and sharing tools for law enforcement, educators, judges, and healthcare professionals and airing public service announcements around the country over 50,000 times. Our goal is to better equip Maryland EMS providers and the public to recognize and report indicators of human trafficking. If you suspect someone is being held against their will, call local law enforcement or the Department of Homeland Security. This aligns with the See Something, Say Something National Action Statement. The following video was produced by the Department of Homeland Security. Mang hết mấy cái đồ mang đây nè, có ăn thoại không? Nè, tao gọi mày, 
đi đi hay mày mày đứa này lấy xe của tôi mang hết miếng rô này lại đừng có gọi đây đi bao lên nè mày lo cái vụ này đi đừng có gọi ai nữa mà không có thời gian là tôi tay giết cả nhà mày á nè đi đi Anh sợ không? Mà làm sao được? Ông chúa này á, ông không có sợ giết gia đình mình Courtney, what are you doing? You're driving like an idiot! Do you want to get to the movie, don't you? Look, it's playing at the gallery in like 45 minutes. I'll just text Josh to meet there. Let me see that. Em cứ bị sao? Đau tay Mà cái xe trời ơi cái xe Courtney uh, There's been an accident at Bunker Lane and Main Street Yes, please send an ambulance. Thank you. Anh thấy người ta tới đây nè. Are you guys okay? Are you hurt? I've already called 911. Are you guys okay? Okay, ma'am, can I ask you to step back sure, by your corner? Sure. We're going to take this. Okay. Just stay behind your car. Thank you. Let them do their job. Paramedics on scene. What do we know? We got two in here. Are you okay? Look, no, no. Stay, stay right there. Are you okay? Do you, are you have any pain? Stay, stay right there. Look, it looks like they don't speak any English. Can you find me an interpreter? Whoa, 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 where are you going? But I know them. Can you interpret? Yes. They work from under boss. Hey, Jack. This guy says he's their boss and he can interpret for you. Yeah, I need him. All right, come on. Talk to this guy. Uh, can you translate? Yes. Can you ask them if they're hurt, if they're in any pain? I thấy mình làm cái xe của tao mà phải trả giá đó. Giờ lắc đầu nói không. Làm đi. They're okay. I'm gonna take them home now. I, it's really best if we do an injury assessment and take some vitals before you take them home and make that decision. They're fine. See, just a scratch. You don't have to go to the hospital. Fine, if, if you'll just wait here, I really need you to sign a release form. Yes, hurry. Frank, I need you to witness this refusal of aid. Yeah, sure. So they don't want help. Look, man, I don't really buy this, I mean, the guy back there, he says he's their boss, but he's really controlling, and he's not concerned with their well-being. All right, listen, here's what I have to do. I have to go and get their names and their identification for my report. Let me see what other information I can get out of them, and then we'll find out what's really going on here. We just gotta be sure we help those victims. Okay. Okay. Excuse me. I'm Officer Provost. You're not in any kind of trouble, okay? I just need some basic information. Help me out, okay? What are your names? Their names are difficult to spell. Here, you can write them down from here. 
Do you understand me? In love. You be quiet. Do you work for him? I told you, be quiet. Where do you live? No luck. I wasn't able to get one more thing out of him. You know, something is just not right. I mean, they are clearly scared of their boss, and I think they're lying about not being injured. And he's adamant about them not getting treatment. Something is wrong. Yeah, you know what? It looks and sounds just like human trafficking. Human trafficking? So what's next? We call ICE. They've got agents and they deal with this kind of stuff all the time. Come on, ICE? Look, they need help. I'm not trying to get them deported. No, listen, it's not like that, okay? They'll get the victims the help that they need. I've worked with ICE before. They know what they're doing. Trust me.